Well, hey there, parametric posse. Can I call you guys that? I think I can. We get to look further into graphing parametric equations today, and in our lesson on angle parameters, where we're at on page four of the parametric packet, if you want to turn there now, um, we'll see theta in the mix. And so what that reminds me of, this is a little spoiler, we perhaps might get to use some good old faithful trig identities today. And also maybe here's a day where conic sections are gonna meet parametric equations, and we'll show how we can graph conics parametrically. Um, as a joke for you to start, my I have a fear. My fear is of speed bumps, but guys, I'm slowly getting over it. All right, looking at the top of page four. I don't want to dwell on this warm up for too long. I just want to mention a couple things about it. I love reiterating the idea that two different sets of parametric equations can give you the same shape graph, but maybe it's traced out in a different way, whether it's more quickly or less quickly or in a different orientation. You have your original parametric functions in the warm-up, x equals t and y equals t squared to give you this parabola graph where the orientation is from left to right. Well, what would the change be in part A? It just says, how would the graph change? The only thing changed here is the sign of the horizontal component. So all this is gonna do, it's gonna reverse the orientation. You'll get the same, whoops, orientation. You'll get the same shaped graph just traced out in the opposite direction. What about, what's the difference in part B? It looks like the only difference in part B is that one is added to the horizontal component. That's gonna shift the graph horizontally. So I'll say shift one unit in the horizontal direction. We're adding one to the X's. So let's push it positively to the right. So we'll say to the right. If you tried to graph this one, you get the same exact picture, shifted one to the right. And how about the shift for the last one? The X component stays untouched and the vertical component has now one added to that. And I said shift here, how about shift? This last one's also going to be a shift. And as we see that one is added to all the Y's, we'll shift up one unit, okay? But the main event of today has to do with theta, and we're going to talk about eliminating angle parameters. I'm claiming that in examples one and two on page four, one has cosine and sine, and two has secant and tangent. I'm hoping you're already thinking of possible trig identities we could use, one that associates some sort of sine with cosine, and another one associating secant with tangent. Um, and a way to eliminate the parameter in both cases, graph this how we know and love rectangularly, and then go back to the parametric version to determine maybe the position, the speed, and the orientation. So first, I wanna look at number one and see what we can do here. And I, if we're trying to relate cosine and sine, I'm gonna say step one is you isolate the trig functions in both cases. So in this first one, can you get cosine of theta by itself? And that's pretty easy, we can divide both sides by three. So you get cosine of theta equals x over three. All right, how about sine of theta here? So it says y equals four sine of theta. Let's divide both sides by four and you'll get just sine of theta equals y over four. And now I gotta think. We're only tracing this from zero to two pi. That's good to think about. It's also good to think about your own original domain and range to keep it consistent with what your answer is gonna be. But how could we relate sine and cosine in one nice identity. Think of your Pythagorean identities, right? Sine squared plus cosine squared. If I had each one of these expressions squared, it should always equal one if we're talking about the same theta, right, in each case. Well, can you use a substitution here, but we're gonna square our expressions for sine and cosine this time. So sine was y over four. We'll put that here, y over four squared. Now let's square cosine plus x over three squared has to equal one. And this will work well for us as a rectangular equation. We're not gonna have very many problems graphing this now that we got it into an easier to handle format, but let's get standard form of this conic squared through the parentheses. So y squared over 16 plus x squared over nine equals one. And I have to smile at this point. I'm happy because this is a conic section that I'm very used to. It's the equation of an ellipse that would be pretty quick to graph rectangularly, and we can just use the original parametric when we need things like the orientation of it. Um, it's an ellipse that's centered at the origin. Let's get this on a graph. And you are traveling four up and down from the origin to get to the two major vertices here, and you're traveling three right and left of the origin to get to the co-vertices. 
Now you sketch your, whoops, missed it a little bit. You sketch your ellipse from there, make it as smooth a curve as possible. I'm going to try to use this sketching tool to make this look as best as it possibly can. Oh, well, that was already a failure. And then I was thinking I could just slide it over because I was nervous about graphing it freehand. Let's try that one more time. So see how your ellipse looks. Hopefully yours hit the actual vertices there. Mine missed the mark by a little bit. There's one thing that you are still missing here, and that is the orientation of the curve. And we would, we would kind of consult the original equations to make that decision here. What I would do is this. You already did the hard work of converting it to rectangular form to graph it. There's no need to make a huge full out table for this with a lot of X's and Y's. As we did in previous sections, you just need the orientation. So plotting even just two points on this would be sufficient. Pick easy values that we would know off the top of our head from zero to two pi. So quadrantals would be nice, like zero and maybe the next quadrantal that's gonna be counterclockwise, pi over two. Try plugging in zero. You've got three times the cosine of zero. Three times one gives you three. Three times the sine of zero should give you zero. Three times, here's the x for pi over two. Three times the cosine of pi over two should give you zero, another vertex. Three times, or four times the sine of pi over two, four times one gives me four. We knew of these points, a vertex and a covertex. Here's your point at theta equals zero, falls right where it would have fallen on a unit circle, and here's your point at theta equals pi over two. You can trust that around this ellipse, you have this counterclockwise orientation. Last thing I'll mention, I know we've been on this one for a while. Keep in mind, the original's domain and range has the same domain and range as your final picture. You know that cosine, right, has to stay between negative one and one. One's the highest it could ever get to, negative one's the lowest it could ever get to. So the domain of this original parametric equation, x has to stay between negative three and three. And in your picture, it does stay between negative three and three. Similarly with sine, right? Sine has the highest value it could ever get to is one, the lowest value it could ever get to is negative one. That means four times one is the highest y will be, and four times negative one is the lowest. So this was a little side note at the end, but it's gonna come into play big time in number two, where the original in the quadrants we care about doesn't have a domain and range of all reals. We'll talk about that in a second. So let's shift our thinking to number two, but I do want to start this um, problem in the exact same way by taking the two expressions that are given at the top and let's isolate the trig function in both of them. I wonder why secant and tangent were picked. That must have been by design that we could relate each of these equations to a different Pythagorean identity. Let's solve for secant here. So x minus one, I think over three is gonna equal the secant of theta. And in the second part, um, what, just y, y plus three? Y plus three equals tangent. And I gotta think back to a Pythagorean identity relating secant and tangent. And that was secant squared of theta equals tangent squared of theta always plus one. And if I want this to look more like the equation in standard form of a conic section, your squared trig functions are going to be on the same side of the equation. So this could also be written as secant squared minus tangent squared of theta equals 1. I wonder if your mind already runs to a different type of conic section here. Over in number one, we had an ellipse. You had a y squared plus an x squared equation. Here, we have a minus in between. I wonder if you're anticipating that this one might be up a hyperbola or part of a hyperbola. Let's plug in. Can you plug in the secant squared? So x minus one over three squared minus this expression squared, y plus three squared equals one. And that's almost in standard form. I'm going to square this first denominator. So you'll have in standard form x minus 1 squared over 3 squared divided by 9 minus, I'll put a 1 placeholder for the denominator here, y plus 3 squared over 1 equals 1. Now be careful about this one. Yes, this is an equation of the hyperbola, but I warned you. I'm going to put a second star here because I warned you about your domain restrictions. So in a second, we'll talk about those. Before we get to that, I mean, we just came to a really cool part of this problem where we can decide on some features of this hyperbola, kind of like we did with the ellipse. You have a center this time not at the origin at 1 comma negative 3. Go ahead and find your vertices, and could you also find your asymptotes for me? You can feel free to pause the video while you try this and then turn it back on to check. So vertices, 
from that center, you're going left and right uh, three, the square root of nine. So you'll have one minus three, so negative um, four, uh, negative two, right? One minus three, negative two, negative three. It's gonna be one vertex that we care about. And then one plus three, right? Four comma negative three should be right for another vertex. Um, how about asymptotes? That'll just help with the way. I always like to graph the asymptotes so that my hyperbola looks a little bit better. It helps me define its shape. So for asymptotes, use point slope form with the center. Asymptotes always go through the center. So y minus k uh, over here, y plus three equals plus or minus. We'll get the slope last and use the x minus one in point slope form. Now we find the slope. It's either A over B or it's B over A. In this case, for review, you have a horizontally oriented hyperbola. And so that means you're running A and you're rising B. This is going to be plus or minus B over A. So in this case, we'll say plus or minus 1 over 3 and then X minus 1. Before we go back and talk about domain, let's start this sketch with just the center and a vertex. And we'll put the asymptotes on there too. So the center is at 1, negative 3. The vertices are at negative two, negative three, so we are three this way, and then we're way off the graph this way. That's a little curious why, as to, um, I wonder why, I didn't even give you enough room to plot it on this picture. Maybe the quadrant three area is gonna be the most important part of this, and we'll explain why. This hyperbola is gonna be defined by its asymptotes, which have a slope of one third, so rise over run. You're gonna go up one and over three. You've got asymptotes generally looking like that. And then I'll go up through that point and then another one this way, okay? And we have something like this. So what's the big mystery here? Why only leave room for the left side of this graph? Well, here is the important part. Go back up to the original. Let's, de let's decide on the original domain and range so that we can match that with the domain and range of our solution. We are only talking about what quadrants here, from pi over two to three pi over two. So we're only talking about, I'm gonna fill in a little set of coordinates for a unit circle here. Pi over two has coordinates zero, one. Pi has coordinates negative one, zero. And negative, I'm sorry, down here, 3 pi over 2 has coordinates 0, negative 1. Think about what happens to secant over here for a second. All your x values in those two quadrants are all negative, and they're all decimals. And the, the x value here, the lowest it ever gets to is negative 1. For secant, right, you would be putting 1 over that x. So what that means is you're going to be flipping these tiny negative decimals, giving you huge negative numbers. And what that means here is that in this case, the secant of theta in, the, in this particular part of the unit circle is always going to stay less than or equal to negative 1. Negative 1 over here is the highest that secant's ever going to get to. And then you'll have lower negative values for flipping the x values in those two quadrants. And and what it means for x is that x is going to stay less than or equal to 1 plus 3 times negative 1. We can plug that value in for secant. This is the trickiest part of graphing one of these. And trust me, we're going to go through this multiple more times to get a little bit more used to it. But when I solve it out, I get that x has to stay less than or equal to 1 minus 3, so negative 2. That's important. I'm actually going to tag that as a domain restriction onto my rectangular answer. We're only graphing this hyperbola for the side, for the left branch of it, the side where x is less than or equal to negative 2. There's no reason to worry about the range of this original, because if you'll recall, tangent and cotangent ha can be any real number. So I'm going to say y, this is fancy for y belongs to the set of reals. That's just a symbol that means belong to, belongs to. So there's no reason to worry about restricting a range. We want to graph this left-hand side, so let's put it on the picture. So you have a hyperbola, hopefully yours looks okay, hugging the asymptotes like that. The last thing to decide about is the orientation. You can plot a couple, um, a few quick easy points to get that. I'm actually gonna pause the video for time purposes, fill in a couple points on this table, you check yours with mine, and we'll join back for orientation. I'll pause now. Okay, I've thought back to some of my exact values to plug in a few values to these original parametric equations. Some are gonna come up short for you and they're gonna be undefined. When I plugged in two pi over three, whether in my head or with a calculator, I got five comma, negative five comma, about negative 4.7, this point here. And then when I travel further for theta to pi, I get the vertex. This orientation is going to be sliding this way up that branch of the hyperbola. All right, we got some good problems to come. Stay tuned. 
and I'll see you soon.